So this is what we plan on doing. First, I'll go over something that I think you should know by now. Then we'll go into particle detectors and examples. We have a break. I'll do one more particle detector. And then you can sit back and relax. And we'll have some more fun. So first, what is this all about? This you know. So what we do here is we study particle physics. We study the basic building blocks of matter and their interactions. So in some sense, you know, we go the opposite way of the binoculars, right? So particle accelerators probe the smallest wave distances. And uh, you know the particle wave duality, so the higher the energy, the smaller the wavelength, so the more details you can see. <clears throat> so what are the methods that we use? The methods that we use are actually very simple. So we concentrate energy in particles. We use an accelerator for that. We collide particles. We collide them in two ways. Either we collide them head on. We have two beams of particles, collide them head on. Or we smash them into a stationary target. If we collide them head on, we have a collider detector. We put a detector around it, we call it a collider detector. If you smash them into a stationary particle as target, we have what we call a fixed target experiment. So that's what we do. Now you can ask yourself, a particle detector, what is a particle detector? You go to the dictionary, you look up particle, a very small piece of matter, an electron or proton. And then you have a detector, which is a piece of equipment for discovering the presence of something. You know, like you go to the airport, there's a metal detector. So detectors are extensions of our senses. They make particles visible to human senses. But if you look at this definition, I don't like this definition. Because this definition has too limited an emphasis. And you know, we all live in Illinois, and winter is coming. So uh, I mean, if you go then sometimes in the morning, you wake up and you look in your backyard, you know, you see tracks in the snow. So your eye is a particle detector. It says, hey, you know, an animal has been in my backyard. And that is the definition I just gave you. But, of course, there's lots more you can tell from this. I mean, if you see tracks in your backyard, I hope you can distinguish between tracks of a rabbit and a raccoon. Right? So if you look at these footprints, you know, you may be able to tell what part of what animal it was. From the tracks, you may be able to deduce how heavy it was. Was it well fed? Was the animal running? Was it tired? Or you can even say if the particle, if the, not the particle, if the animal had, had a tail. So that's our definition of the definition that I like of a particle detector. So in some sense, what we want to do with a particle detector is really measure the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's really what we want to do. So to measure, you know, to put it more, you know, in a delicate way, to measure as many properties of all particles as possible. Or we can say the purpose of particle detectors is to fully reconstruct a recorded event. So what we want to do is really identify all the particles that came out of the interaction, measure as many properties as we can, like the mass, the charge, the momentum, and then ultimately reconstruct the fundamental reaction mechanism, deduce what actually went on there. Right? So the end result is the validation of the falsification of the theory. Now, particles are detected through their interaction with matter. This may sound like an obvious statement, but this is the most fundamental statement. If it doesn't interact, you won't see it. As simple as that. So there are many different physical processes involved. You can ask yourself, you know, how does light interact with your eye? What are the processes that are involved there? So there are many different processes involved. But ultimately, in particle detectors, we normally will see ionization and excitation of matter. Now, the other thing that we do here is, um, you know, what you want, of course, is you want to do everything in the world the best possible way, right? So the ideal detector should cover everything, have full coverage, no particles should escape, and you should 
be able to measure everything as precisely as possible. But of course, there's a compromise. I mean, if you want to take a very good picture, a digital picture, you will not use your cell phone to take a high quality digital picture, right? So there's a compromise also for the construction of particle detectors. So normally these particle detectors are integrated systems. They are built up of many, many sub-detectors. And this integration depends on the physics strategy. Again, your cell phone is used to make phone calls, not to take pictures. So the quality of your pictures will be degraded. But hopefully the sound quality is good, right? Or your text messaging works. It doesn't get messed up. So that's the same here. So there are priorities, and you decide what priorities are more important for you. <coughs> and again, particles are detected, again, through their interaction with matter. And that's the next. So I think this, what I'm going to talk about now, I think you should also know. So how do particles interact with matter? Now, you, I think by now you know what the world is, is built of. And we believe that the world, if you look at an atom, there are the leptons that surround the, the atom. The leptons are fundamental, and they appear in nature individually. And there are three of them an electron, a muon, and a tau lepton, with their little brothers or sisters called the neutrinos. And inside an atom, you have a nucleus built up of protons and neutrons, and we believe that these protons and neutrons are built up of quarks. Now, quarks do not appear individually in nature. They only appear in groups, either in groups of two or groups of three. If you have two quarks, we call them mesons, if you have three quarks, we call them baryons, and the sum total we call hadrons. All right? So we believe that matter is built up of these constituents. The three quarks, uh, six quarks, three families, UD, charm, strange, top and bottom, and there is six leptons. Electron, muon, and a tau lepton, with their associated neutrinos. That's where we believe everything is built on. And of course, if I talk about matter, I implicitly assume that every particle has its empty particle. Okay? So, this is the same thing as I showed on the previous slide, six leptons, six quarks. Now they interact. And I think by now you know that there are four fundamental interactions. What are the four fundamental interactions? Yes. Gravity, uh, electromag electromagnetic force, the sh and the strong and weak nuclear force. Very good. <clears throat> so these are the four forces. Gravity, strong, electromagnetic, and weak. For our purposes, gravity is very weak. So we'll ignore it. Give me one example why gravity is weak. Give a and um, hold by the whole mass of the Earth, but you can have a magnet and it picks up that mass? So Perfect example. Perfect. That's right. What holds the table together? Electromagnetic. Electromagnetic. <coughs> and nothing falls through the table. So, it's the weakest force. Now, as I said, not every particle is susceptible to every force. So, if I look at the leptons, if I look at the neutrinos, Neutrinos are only susceptible. Yes. Isn't all the all of the particles susceptible to gravity though? Only if they have mass. <coughs> so neutrinos um, only are susceptible to the weak force. Leptons are only susceptible to the electromagnetic and the weak force. And then the quarks are susceptible to all three forces. Just to make the link with what I said before, if I want to learn something about the strong force and I study neutrinos, I will never learn anything about the strong force by studying neutrinos directly because they don't interact. 